we are really lucky tonight to have this all-class panel on reporting safely on every beat. Um, no tonight is the Mets, and we will get out in time for that. Um, like you to imagine a scenario, okay? Imagine you are released from here in time to make it to City Field. You go out to report on the Mets. Um, this is not a high threat assignment, right? But the game doesn't turn out so well. Uh, the Mets lose, and on the way back, there's a riot. And you are there covering it. How close should you get? Should you be in the middle of the crowd, the edge of the crowd? How do you think about what reporting you're going to do? Who should you talk to? What's your exit strategy? Who do you communicate with? How? Why? What happens if you get a little bit injured? Or let's say uh, that this riot happens, and suddenly, in front of City Field, the cops threaten to arrest you or grab you. What are your rights? What do you do then? Or let's say that one of you, as your master's project, has taken it on herself or himself to do uh, some reporting on sports team ticket scalpers. And you're doing a ride along with ticket scalpers, some people who are outside the, going to outside the stadium to try to sell tickets at a high price. And then it turns out that this particular scalper you're, ca you're packing or you're, you're walking around with is packing a gun. And then it turns out that the scalper across the street is packing a gun. What do you do? How do you think about that? Do you worry about it? These are ordinary assignments. It's not going to a conflict zone. It's not having people fire mortars over your head. You're out for a pleasant evening's reporting, and suddenly you need to worry about your safety. Um, this panel is designed to address those kinds of questions. It's pretty obvious that reporters going to cover Syria or Iraq or Ukraine need to worry about physical threats. But so do all of us. We all need to worry about the psychological stresses. We all need to worry about many dimensions of reporting safety. So this is a, a kickoff to what will be a series of events throughout the year designed to give you some language, some skills, and most of all, some strategic thinking going into your careers as journalists that should be as integral to you as your interview technique, as your photographic technique, as your ethical technique. Um, and this is not abstract. I, I'm just going to draw on two examples, and then we'll move on to the panel. Um, you know, September 11th, 2001. That happened during Fashion Week in New York City. And among the many journalists dashing down toward Ground Zero that day, dashing into the cloud of smoke, were fashion reporters from all over the world who were here to cover those events. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, 10 years ago in August, about a week or so after Katrina, I found my way in New Orleans to a little house on a high piece of ground in a neighborhood called Uptown, which some of you who know New Orleans might know. And in this little house, this little classic New Orleans shotgun house, I knocked on the door. This was the bureau in exile of the New Orleans Times-Picayune, which had fled the city when its newsrooms, newsroom was flooded. And in this house were the handful of reporters who'd stayed behind. They were the paper's art critic, its sports editor, its food writer. All of them were contending with the destruction of their city, with a big natural disaster. You all, sooner or later, are going to find yourselves on assignments where you're running toward danger. It's going to happen. So that's what this panel is about, and that's what this year's conversation is about. We have three powerhouse panelists. Very lucky to have them here tonight. Um, and I'm going to give them in order of speech rather than in physical order on the panel. Um, in the center, uh, Yamish Alcindor, who is a national news, breaking news reporter for USA Today, um, has won all kinds of awards for her coverage of Baltimore, Ferguson, and many other issues. And she is going to talk about some of what she has learned as a journalist of your generation covering 
the dramatic events and beats of our generation. Close to me is uh, Donna de Cesare, who, among other things, is my colleague uh, at the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, where she advises us on Latin America. But she is a photojournalist, associate professor at the uh, University of Texas. For purposes of tonight, she is, Donna is that person you want next to you when things suddenly turn south. Uh, Donna reported from and photographed in Latin America during the civil conflicts of the 1980s. She's reported on gang violence on both sides of the border. She's embedded with teenage youth gangs and really worked in close proximity to people with complicated, dangerous lives. And lately, she's been doing work on environmental poisoning that carries its own risks. She's going to talk about some of what she's learned about self-care over time. And finally, on the far left, my far left, stage right, uh, is, uh, is Danny Spriggs, who is the Vice President for Global Security of the Associated Press. Um, we're lucky to have him on that basis alone. Before that, he was Deputy Director of the US, US Secret Service after decades um, of public service in that agency. And there's no organization with more wisdom for any of you who've had the good fortune to cover presidential visits or visits by foreign dignitaries. There's no one with a better sense of strategic approaches to assessing risk than the Secret Service, and I am dying to hear how this now integrates with the work of the Associated Press. Um, let me just frame this discussion first by saying, uh, A, as a matter of housekeeping, there are tip sheets and bios which will be on the, back, on the table in the back of the room when you leave. B, uh, anyone who's a member of the public not from the school who needs a restroom, they're down the hall. Uh, uh, C, uh, just a shout out, we have another good friend here, uh, John, D J John Danishevsky, who is the um, managing editor for International News or something at the AP and a great leader in the movement for journalism safety generally and freelance journalism safety right now. He's a leader of a major campaign for that. We're lucky to have him and I may throw a net over you at some point in this conversation. Um, Look, safety has many dimensions, and I just want to highlight a few of them for you, which in various ways our speakers may touch on and in some ways may not, but I would just ask you to think about this because what we're talking about is not just one-by-one one tips, but an overall strategy. First of all, let's think about physical safety, how to protect yourself in that crowd at Shea Stadium, how to deal with threatening events that come at you, how to assess physical risks, all of that. Second, digital security. We're not talking about that so much tonight. Um, there's a series of discussions, as you know, that Professor Susan McGregor has been leading on that subject. It's something I know you're all thinking about very much. Um, legal security. You know, what are your rights wherever in the world it happens to be that you are reporting? Who is your legal backup? How do you protect yourself in that way? Psychological security. How are we affected by difficult events that we cover, both that we experience person to person, one on one covering them, and vicarious trauma from the deluge of, uh, of cascading toxic imagery? Um, peer support, trauma awareness. How do we think about that? That's the DART Center's piece of this, and I may talk a bit about that tonight. Um, and finally, professional security. Your ethics, your professionalism, how do those integrate and tie together with all these other ways of thinking about safety and security? Ethical, professional journalism at the highest level is in many ways your best protector and is a common thread that is going to tie through this conversation and I hope conversations throughout the year. I'm now going to shut up, because if I don't, I won't, um, and turn it over to Yamish Alcindor, who will take us through 10 minutes or so. Then we'll go through Donna, Danny, and then a conversation with the room. Good evening. Um, as 
As Bruce said, I'm Yemi Shasta Norman, national breaking news reporter for USA Today. So I graduated from the purple school down, down south, known as NYU, <laughs> um, with my master's degree um, only in May. And I am very much, I think, still learning a whole lot about journalism. Um, I graduated from Georgetown not too long ago. So when I say I'm a journalism of your age, I don't just look young. I'm very, <laughs> I'm pretty um, new to this. But I think what I really want to talk about in the 10 minutes that I have is the idea of what I've learned just as a young reporter and in, through intern doing internships. So I told Bruce this story and I'm going to tell you guys this story. One of the first things that I think of when I think of security and safety was me at about maybe 17 or eight, maybe 18 years old. I was an intern for the Miami Herald at the time and I was driving to work in Miami where the building used to be and it was kind of in a shady part of Miami. Um, in inner city Miami and I was driving and I heard gunshots and I saw this guy running and I saw the police and I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna embed in this situation. And I like was about to get out of my car and I called my editor at the Miami Herald and say, hey, there's a shooting, like cops are running after, I'm about to run after them. And they're like, uh, yeah, kid, no, get back <laughs> in your car. And we're gonna send the crime reporter down there, like you, like, like, what do you mean you're running after the police as gunshots? Like that's not gonna happen. And that person ended up um, dying of those gunshots. And it was really important because I, at the time, thought that covering crime and covering and covering that meant that you had to be right where the guns were, and you had to be, you know, the bullets are whizzing by. So that's how you cover crime. And I've really learned to be a lot smarter and more strategic about how to report on the news. So I pulled this picture up, and I think it's on full view, right? Full yes. View. I pulled this picture up because this is me running in Ferguson. If you had told me, first of all, I was supposed to be in Ferguson for like five days, and I ended up like basically living in Ferguson for a couple months. Um, so I'd pack this bag, and I always pack this bag with all these different types of things that I'll talk about later. But basically, it's always like clothes and all weather gear and my chargers. So in this in this picture, you see pretty much my plan almost going up in up, up in flames. So this is my last dress I had ever had in my bag because everything else was dirty after like two weeks of being there. I had bought I had bought this dress because I really liked to party, and I thought, well, maybe one night I'll be able to hang out in <laughs> Missouri, and it'll be you know my cute dress. And it was like not the appropriate dress to wear to a protest. <laughs> but here is my dress. And those sneakers, of course, I hadn't packed any sneakers. I had packed like nice, comfortable, like like leather flats that I thought were gonna cut it. And within day two, I was like, oh no. So I bought these, these sneakers from Target. I have a five-star ring notebook because I also didn't think to pack extra notebooks. So I'm, I'm running around in like, a fifth grader's notebook in my hand with like Hello Kitty on it, trying to ask people serious questions. <laughs> and I'm in the middle of charging my phone <laughs> on the go while running. And everybody in the picture, it's hilarious to me, is like looking toward what's ever going on. And I'm like about to get out of there. So I think this picture to me reminds me of what I've learned in journalism. And it's pack more clothes. It's <laughs> have, have a portable charger. It's make sure you actually have stuff for me as a writer that you have stuff to really write down on and really make sure you have something that, that you're comfortable with and mobile with to go on um, and tell those stories so that you can just be physically safe. So when we talk about physically safe, are you clothed, are you fed? Those are the things, like I'm a completely different reporter when I'm hungry. Like I am not <laughs> the reporter you wanna be to send me to things when I'm hungry. So I've learned a lot about just packing snacks and packing water because my editors can tell if I'm like hungry because I'm like, I have typos and all these things are going on. So I think that that's something that I've really learned. Um, so then I want to talk about a lot of a, a lot of the stories that I've only been out of the country, unlike some of our other distinguished panelists, I've really only been out of the country journalistically twice. Once was to Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and that really wasn't a dangerous situation. And another time was at Botswana, which was also not a very dangerous situation. So all the times that I've felt really like, oh my God, something might happen, it's been in the United States. And it's been for normal stories that I thought were gonna be quick, even with Ferguson, most people didn't think Ferguson was gonna be this months long protest and things had kind of been, one or two stories had burned down, but it, we, we didn't really understand Ferguson in the first couple of days. So every place that I've gone has been really um, enlightening. So one of the things I wanted to show you was, these are some vines that I took while I was in Ferguson. I shot someone burning the American flag, um, I went inside and actually was talking to the to these men who were looting the store, um, and I also 
Um, I'm inside a store as it's burning. This is not a very smart move, but <laughs> I was like, it's news is happening. I must cover a store while it's burning. And I posted this, and one of my mentors who was in Ferguson with me as well, another reporter was like, why are you in a burning store? Like, get out of the burning store. And it kind of brought me back to reality, thinking like, okay, this is cool. I want to cover this. And, and when I think cool, I think like, this is what this is going on, like this is so important, but in some ways it's like, what? I don't understand how quickly fire spreads. Like if I'm standing there, like who knows what would have happened if the, if the fire had spread and I was stuck in that building? Like is it really worth this vine? Um, so that's, so one of the things that I really want, also wanna talk about really quickly um, is when I think about going into these situations, I was talking to Bruce about this, I really think about like me as a person, what can I, what, what, am, I, what am I approaching people, I, I, and what does it mean to have my characteristics? So one, I'm very friendly, two, I'm a woman, three, I'm African American, and four, I'm, I'm a pretty short stature. So I try to remember all those things and try to, in some ways, put people at ease. And it's not to befriend everybody, but like these looter, these people that were looting the store. Um, I ended up writing a column about the idea that people that we thought were, you know, these evil looters and the rioters and those words that we were using to characterize people's kids were really 19 and 18 year olds that were trying to get my number and trying to like pick me up while also looting. And to me, it made them really understand people's humanity. It's that these people aren't just terrible people that are gonna be violent at no end. These are really angry people that are angry for a very specific reason, and it's because they're black young men that really don't feel appreciated or valued or safe in their communities. So while I'm not gonna endorse looting, this idea of taking the situation and not just saying, oh my God, I'm so scared of these people that I can't interview them, to me, I never wanna, um, do that to people, and I've never really done anything with gangs, but to me that's another thing that I would imagine that when you're, when you're approaching these people, it's like, oh, you're a gang member, but it's like you're someone's kid, you're someone's humanity, so I think that when I think, like, was I, I wasn't flirting with the looters, but if they were asking me to walk home, I was using that as an opportunity for me to say, well, if you really wanna walk me into my car, let's talk about why you just did what you did, let's talk about what the violence, that, that, you know, because they're gonna call you rioters, what, what do you, what is that, how does that make you feel? So I think that in my reporting, I've really tried to use every part of what I bring as a journalist to explain to people. I grew up in inner city Miami, so I also understand a lot, and I'm African American. So for me, I consider myself understanding some of the things that are making people very frustrated. But that doesn't mean that when I go interview the CEO of Teen Mobile, I also, even if we're not from the same backgrounds, I also think that I should be able to use whatever life experience I have there. But in this case, since we're talking about security tonight, I really think my security, a lot of Reporters were roughed up in Ferguson. It was a lot of things that happened. People were arrested. I was lucky not to be one of those reporters. And it's not to say that I, that, that I was doing that much different from what other reporters were doing, but I know in my mind, I was thinking, I really don't want to go to jail. And I, don't, I have a mother who is going to really ask me hard questions if I end up in prison. So I need to ask myself, like, how do I do this? So for me, I was really one of the friendliest reporters there. I, I really was nice to the cops. I was nice to the looters. I was nice to whatever protesters. Even if you had a rock in your hand, you're about to throw it at somebody. I smiled at you and introduced myself and told you who I was. Because to me, I wanted everyone to think of me as a human. And for me, I've, I was graced to not be arrested and to not have anybody rough me up and to not have anything stolen from me, even when I saw other people's st things getting stolen because I tried to explain to people um, what that was like. Um, and then the other thing that I'm gonna say really briefly, because I know it's probably only two minutes. Um, At this, do this but this is a story, probably my, I, there are, I wrote a lot of stories in Ferguson, but this is a story that I'm most proud of. Um, and the headline was Ferguson struggles to grasp why protesters turn violent. And what I did in this story was interview somebody who was throwing rocks at the police. So it took me a couple days to decide how to approach this story, but I thought I really wanna get someone on the record who can talk to me about what it's like to throw rocks at the police. What's, what's it like to do something that you know is illegal? And this guy was, to me, perfect. His name was Barry Perkins. And I ended up interviewing him about the fact that he knows that throwing rocks at the police are not gonna help him in his overall goal, but it feels really good. And to me, that was a story that needed to be told. It was like, instead of just saying, oh my God, the, you know, there's, there's rocks throwing, that could be three sentences in your story. How about explaining to people why that is? And th for this guy, he felt like he was underemployed, he was working at a factory, um, he felt, he, at work, working at a family for lower than minimum wage, he felt like because he had made, made some mistakes stealing cars as a, as a teenager, that now as an adult he was continuously paying for those mistakes and he couldn't ever get out of that kind of cycle of, of criminalization even though his records showed that he hadn't done anything in probably the, the last six years to break the law, but this idea that if you ever messed up, that you have to live with that for the rest of your life. So that's why he felt like throwing rocks at the police. And I felt like 
I felt really good about that story because I just felt like I wanted to go deeper than just us saying that people are throwing lots at the police, which is what I had been doing probably for through maybe a week um, of reporting. But at some point, I felt like I wanted to do that. And I think that the reason why he talked to me was really because I asked him in, in a really, I think, sincere way. And I told him, like, people say that this is wrong, but I just want to get your side of the story. And I think that that was, that was part of me trying to humanize myself. And I told him a little bit about myself. Like, I, understand, I, I, I try to relate to him as much as possible. Um, so that's kind of what I think security is, and I kind of think that that's my experience, so thanks. That's great, thank you. Um, and, y you know, I s we'll talk more about this later, but I especially liked what you said about listening to colleagues and mentors, having other people on your shoulder and, and being open to that. I know for me, one of the people I tend to listen to is Donna, so um, we will transition to you. And we'll, we'll have con questions for all the panelists once we kind of go around once. So what do we mean by safety? Almost any story on any beat involves some or all of the safety areas that Bruce mentioned in his introduction. Psychological, ethical, legal, physical. As a photographer, I've covered lots of different kinds of stories. The Civil War in El Salvador, natural disasters, social movements, and stigmatizing issues that exact a high price on the youth of the Americas. Photography is an embedded form of reporting. It requires that you be present, that you be mindful, and that you are focused. Photographers have to go into locations where things are happening, and they usually have to get close, both physically and emotionally, in order to convey context at the level that it can be seen. The quality of observation benefits from the kinds of relationships the photographer builds. And that's exactly what Yamish was just talking about, that your relationship with people, being human with people, letting them be curious about who you are as well, um, is absolutely essential. That keeps you safe, because the people you report on, if you develop that relationship, don't want to see you get hurt either. When a situation's unpredictable, um, like the situation where there was still danger from falling rock in the aftermath of a hurricane in Guatemala, or a volatile situation that I faced in El Salvador when armed soldiers were facing off against protesting citizens who were certain the election had been stolen by military collusion, or when there's a knowable and testable danger from lead pollution, as was the case in both Peru and Argentina, it's clear that risk assessment and contingency planning can help a reporter physical and emotional safety. So how do we, oops. So if you're covering a protest and your assignment is to stay close and capture the police response to the protesters, you need to consider your own safety vis-a-vis -vis the police and military. Where do you position yourself to be the safest? Will you need special protective gear if pepper spray or tear gas is likely to be used? Um, so you think about those things. And you, know, you don't want to go into a situation, many situations you do not want to go in looking like a walking camera store. I hardly ever wear a photographer vest or display my press credentials. But in a protest, that's a situation where you might want to do that because you do want yourself to be identified um, to the police. In other situations, you want to develop a rapport by introducing yourself to people and having a conversation with them. Um, but I will say that it's very important also that no matter where you're reporting, if it's the first time you're going somewhere, talk to the local reporters who live there, who work there every day. For example, in Mexico City right now, I understand that a lot of the media photographers are no longer wearing their vests at street demonstrations because they are being specifically targeted by the police because they're media. So you have to know the situation that you're going into. And if the police become confrontational, you need to know what to do. The ACLU has a good summary of photographers' rights online, and it's something that all of you should be familiar with, um, whether you're using your iPhone to make your images or you're a press photographer. Um, knowing your rights um, means that you're going to react in a way that is calmer, and you're going to try to diffuse the situation. Um, in these situations, that's sort of like Yamish was saying, being friendly with everybody is really, really important. And knowing your rights can't prevent a scared person from calling the police instead of saying hello <laughs> and asking you about picture taking in the park. But it can help you remain level headed like this college, college English professor. He published an open letter in the Cambridge Chronicle 
so that folks in his community would understand what can happen when fear becomes disproportionate. When I was in Ecuador this summer, I was staying in a location that suffered a major outbreak of chikungunya, which is a mosquito-borne um, disease. And because I had done some research online before going, I was able to bring with me really high DEET um, mosquito repellent and insect um, impregnated, uh, insect repellent impregnated clothing, um, which was really important to being able to stay safe from getting that illness. I've had dengue before. I didn't, definitely didn't want to get sick again. But even when it's, you're going on an assignment to a place that doesn't have a special, a specific likelihood of social unrest or uh, a particular health um, alert, like uh, the chikungunya alert, your reporting and research can alert you to other risks. Before I went to Peru, I learned that a lot of the children in the location I was going to be visiting had tested with lead blood levels at least triple what the CDC considers cause for concern. And I knew I was only going for two weeks, but that I, it was a community that I was going to want to go back to um, repeatedly. And so I decided that I should have my blood tested before I went to establish a baseline and then again when I came home to see if I had been impacted um, in that, those two weeks so that I would know on the next trip how to protect myself better. And it turned out that you know, I didn't have any uh, uh, higher level of lead or other metals in my blood, but it was an important precaution to take. But knowing a location's history is really important. And you know, it's just like all, you know, the things you do to stay safe are the same things you do to be a good reporter. You want to know as much as you can about the situation before you go in. You want to have contacts on the ground who you can trust and who will help you when you get there. You want to know other reporters. Um, and when I was going to this community that was um, very effective, uh, affected by a history of social unrest, it was really important for me to understand what they had gone through in the past so that I could understand the reactions of some of the environmentalists who were terrified. They hardly even wanted to talk to me. And it's because in the past they had been victimized by labor unions who were in favor of the industry. But if I didn't know that, everything seemed quiet and there wasn't any really obvious tension on the surface, I might have thought their, their fears were disproportionate. So, when it comes to equipment planning, it helps to plan ahead um, and to stay mobile. So throwing everything you can think of in a suitcase or picking up items on your, at the destination can work, but the problem with that is, is that your backpack can end up too heavy and too disorganized to be able to find the things you need when you need them. So my recommendation, and I won't go into you know, specific details now, but things that you think you're likely to need, and you know, some, in some ways it's like packing for going on a hike or a camping trip. You need water, you need food, you need, you, know, you need extra batteries for your cell phone, you need your communications devices to work. And you also might think about printing out paper copies of maps or at least using Google Maps offline, downloading the maps so that if you lose your GPS or your uh, internet connection, you can still have access to the maps. Um, the most important part is the communication and safety contact tree and protocols you have with your newsroom or whoever you're reporting with um, for emergency situations. This helps you remain clear-headed in a crisis. Even if you're working solo without an assignment, um, it's a good idea to have communication with someone who knows where you are. You should be checking in with people. And if you're working with a local um, guide or fixer, um, to, to make sure that you discuss security issues with that person. Um, the DART uh, website has some digital resources for covering traumatic events and, you know, sometimes certain pro uh, projects that you might be working on, you might want to download specialized apps in advance so that you can be reporting and staying in touch on the go as well. Ethical safety means getting it right, and today there are so many flashpoints and volatility all around us that taking time to research ahead and being sure that you're verifying your reporting, thinking about the safety of your team, but also thinking about the safety of your sources, which is something we don't always talk about. That's critical to our own ethical journalism. A lot of the stories that I do involve young people who are at various kinds of risk. and. Um, when I was doing this project, which was in Guatemala, where I was working with kids who were living on the streets who were HIV positive, and kids who were um, 
being victimized by the police, it was really important not to show their identities um, in making the pictures. So that's something that I take very seriously, that the people that I'm, or entrusting me with their stories, I need to be concerned about their safety as well. Um, and I often develop a collaborative relationship with them in the sense that I'll ask them how would they like to be photographed in order to protect their identity and also make an image that says something about their situation. We can't know everything or be prepared, prepared for every contingency. That's why it's important for you to share what you learn with other journalists and that you reach out to others with experience before undertaking a risky assignment. It's a way we all stay safe and it helps us to report more effectively for the communities that we serve. Thanks. That was great, thank you. Um, Donna, you used a phrase that when I think of what AP does, and especially when I think of what the Secret Service does, um, you use a phrase that I think is crucial, which is before, during, and after. I think one of the crucial ways of thinking about all kinds of safety considerations on any assignment, whether it's of one story's duration or years long duration, is what's the preparation before, during, and after. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to the expert in that. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, I will be the elephant in the room, particularly when I hear about people throwing rocks at cops who have guns, and we hear about people not wearing their protective gear. I get a little nervous. One of the things that we do at the AP is to address each and every one of those situations. Just in the way of a 30-second commercial, you, already, you probably already know this, on any given day, the half of the world's population gets its news from the AP. So, that's my 30 second commercial about the AP, <laughs> but it's also a fact. <laughs> On March 30th, 1981, I was with the president doing an attempted assassination event. Delivering a speech at the Washington Hilton Hotel, President Ronald Reagan is escorted by the Secret Service to his limousine. I preceded the president as he uh, exited the Washington Hilton Hotel, which was the VIP entrance and exit. And as we exited onto the street, there was a crowd off to my left. And as the president makes his way to the right rear of the door, the limousine, then the shots rang out. I turned immediately to my left when I heard the gunshots. I drew my weapon and actually could see an individual firing in my direction. The would-be assassin is a 25-year-old white male, John Hinckley Jr. Special Agent Tim McCarthy moved between the gun and the president and took a bullet directly in the stomach that could have easily struck the president. That is what agents swear to do. They're very brave, uh, they're very patriotic, and they will actually take a bullet for the president. Special agent in charge, Jerry Parr, immediately uh, moved to evacuate the president from the line of fire and forced him into the rear of the vehicle. Six shots were fired and the, the round that actually wounded the president came as a direct result of a ricochet off of the limo door. Jerry couldn't find any bullet hole, and there was no blood, but uh, a minute or so after the car left the hotel, Jerry noticed there was blood coming out of the president's mouth and made the decision to send the cars to the hospital and not to the White House. In addition to Secret Service agent Timothy McCarthy, the other victims of the attack were police officer Thomas Delahanty and Reagan press secretary James Brady, who suffered a bullet wound to his head which left him permanently disabled. But after the chaos subsided, two questions remained. On March 30th, 1981, the Secret Service unequivocally saved the president's life. They did it because of three things, planning, proper response, and having the necessary 
contingency plan in order to save a president's life. Take me to my current job at the AP. My department was created in 2008 to an organization, a news organization that had been around since 1846. Did the Secret Service all of a sudden have an epiphany that they needed a security department after centuries of actually working in hostile environments, high-risk environments? No. The AP and journalists such as yourselves, or will be, were making security decisions. But it goes without saying that in this day and age, with the complexity of different terrorist activities, criminal activities, the, the natural disasters that take place, the risk environment that we currently live in is becoming more and more complicated. The AP decided that within this organizational structure that they would have a single department with a single focus on security, working with our news department to make sure that we, my department, was at the table during the discussions who weren't conflicted relative to what action should be taken. Are journalists conflicted? I think you heard a little bit about this, and I'm pretty sure just based on your background, I get it when journalists come to me and say that they need to be there, that there is a competitive edge of being there, being first, and being accurate. I get all of that. What, we've asked, what we uh, ascertain in, the, in our strategies is just to be smart about it. And that's, how, that, and that's how we approach things. We're asking journalists to really just be smart about it. In our department, we have strategized with a philosophy of trying to make sure that we use proactive measures as opposed to reactive measures. We want to try to prevent journalists from getting hurt versus dealing with it after the fact. And in some cases, the discussion leads toward avoidance. How can we avoid this? And so that's been our major focus throughout as far as how we go about this. Now, for the, for the sake of time, I'm going to just kind of jump through some of the things we've already pointed out here. But I do want to go over what our approach has been relative to this action plan. We want to plan as much as we possibly can. And even though there might be breaking news, we want journalists of a mindset of making sure that the safety issues come into play. So in working with our news department, and one of our leaders is here, we basically come up with a template that basically says, when you pitch a story and you're going into a high-risk area or an area or an assignment that has a potential to be dangerous, there's certain things we want you to cover, starting first of all with the journalism uh, assessment. What is the story? What do we plan to gain as a result of this story, at, at, of this particular assignment? Is there an overall coordinator? Now, when some of these things I'm going to talk about is not just for high-risk areas or war zones. They also are applicable to covering the Ebola in Central Africa or Haiti during the earthquakes, which was volatile in and of itself. Because, as you, you know, one of the things that came out in that situation was because of the earthquake and how devastating it was, heck, everybody that was in prison now was on the street. So what did we do to try to, you know, mitigate that? And, of course, natural disasters as far as, you know, your, your storms, your hurricanes, your tornadoes and whatnot. So these, these guidelines are really applicable for all of that. So I'm going to go through them relatively quick. One of the things I am going to talk about, though, for maybe half a minute is the aspect of training and, and the use of protective gear. Let's rewind a little bit. Let me take you back to 1981. The shooting that you just saw, not a single agent, including yours truly, were wearing its protective vest. Why was that? It was because of the intel, the assessment that was done at that time suggested that we probably would not have any problems. There were no demonstrators. There were no individuals that had come to our attention. We had uh, a pretty good security plan in place. So the wearing of the vest was optional. 
It was optional. And you saw what happened. I spent the next 23 years, I was a young agent at that time, as you could tell I had hair. <laughs> I was a young agent at that time, and I spent the next, three, next 23 years making sure that I was not, nor anybody under my supervision, was ever going to be in a situation like that again. And I didn't, if it meant the protection of the president, a former president, former first lady, they were going to be vested up. So my point in pointing that out is, when you're covering that demonstration, when you're covering that conflict with you have, when you have all the security and you're maybe embedded with the police and the military, you don't know when something's going to happen. So what we try to do at the AP is, one, make sure that you go through some kind of hostile environment or first aid training. And this is not just prior to an assignment, but also uh, going out on assignment, but also if you're being relocated to a high risk area. To make sure that you have that training, it's a four or five day course, and to make sure that you have the necessary protective equipment. And when we talk about being conflicted and breaking news and getting out there, this is my favorite photograph as far as teaching moments. When you're in the middle of the line of fire and all around you are wearing tactical and protective gear, there's probably a good indication that you should be wearing yours as well, okay? Look, these, these guys have already put in place sandbags. They're expecting trouble. And yet we have a journalist right in the middle of the kill zone, if you will, without any protective gear. More importantly, at a distance that nobody sees you in a combat stance, which is a combat stance with a video camera. This is what law enforcement and military are trained to do as far as a combat stance, you don't see that camera, and you definitely don't see any identification. So when I talk about being smart and using your equipment and whatnot, that's basically what we're talking about. We in the AP, when we ever have a, a large event where we have cross-format teams go out, we sometimes create a, a cross-format coordinator. When we're talking about uh, communication, it's extremely important to make sure that that coordinator knows what you're doing, what, uh, that you're following through, whatever the plan is relative to calling in and checking in on a regular basis. It's extremely important. The makeup of the team is important. You have, we in the AP, we like to work in teams or the buddy system. If you're working in teams, you have video, you have text, you have photos, you know, know what your surroundings are, and of course, we can go into a little bit more detail as far as egresses as well. Because things change very quickly, as I'm pretty sure you saw in Ferguson, we saw it in Baltimore as well. And you're right, some journalists got roughed up. You have to be aware of your, your surroundings. And so when you're at the scene, it, it really becomes important to, to make sure that you know where the good guys are, where the bad guys are, and that the bad guys, as well as the good guys, can turn on you in any minute, okay? And we've seen excess, uh, samples of that as far as law enforcement, the good guys. And then, do you have an exit plan? If you're, particularly if you're working in a foreign country and you're covering a conflict zone and whatnot, where, did, where, where do you, as far as your contingency, where do you retreat to? And is that road going to be clear for you to be able to retreat to? Retreat to? Where is the nearest medical facility? These are all the criteria that have to be established in your overall security plan as you're moving forward. Now, we in global security, we have a mantra. Proper planning and practice prevents poor performance. I'll say it again. Proper planning and practice prevents poor performance. We not only take that into our individual operations, but we also use that same philosophy in securing our facilities throughout the world. And we've got more than 240. I would like to take credit for that adage, but the guy who really gets credit for that is the security chief um, on 9-11 who was working for Morgan Stanley. He not only lived it, but he died because of it. But, in the, in, but what he did do was save almost 3,000 lives during 9-11. So 
What we talk about, and we can get a little bit more detail as we have our discussion and whatnot, proper planning is really what is essential in moving forward and, car and carrying out your duties. I do get it, but, I'm a, I'm, but I'll say it again, and I'll underscore it throughout our discussion here. You just have to be smart about it. And we work as a team at DAP. I work really closely with our news department. And one of the things that I make sure that me and my security managers don't do, and that is we're not there to hinder your ability to do your job. What we do want to do is to raise the issues, how you've addressed them, what are your contingencies and whatnot. But under no circumstances do we want to be the obstacle for, to, to obstruct you from doing your job, which is essential. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right, I, I'm just going to underscore and I'll add a little bit to some of the points that were made, and then um, you can line up the mic and we can begin having a conversation. Um, bearing in mind, by the way, that this is being recorded, so if there's something you don't want your grandmother or your kid sister to see, don't say it. Um, Yamish, you said something I really liked. You were very honest about something. You were talking about food. You said that when you don't eat enough, you're a different person and a different reporter. I, I think it's very important to underscore, A, that very simple point that biological self-care is very important to any kind of stressful assignment, but also that there are other ways in which you can become a different person and a different reporter. Physical exhaustion and sleeplessness lead to changes in judgment, mistakes in judgment, changes in your capacity. A steady diet of overwhelming chronic trauma and violence can lead to psychological injury, like post-traumatic stress disorder. A singularly disabling set of uh, circumstances for journalists because it affects uh, memory, affects your ability to focus and concentrate, can cause you to lose empathy, and ability to connect to others. Um, we talk a lot at the DART Center about resilience, about building your resilience when covering news, when working on challenging features. So it's not just a matter of avoiding psychological injury or assuming that you're going to get in trouble, because you're not. Uh, most of us, the research shows that as journalists, we are a very resilient tribe. But you do need to think about all of the different kinds of stresses, as well as the physical threats, that can cause you to be a different person impede your new news judgment, impede your ability to stay safe, impede your ability to uh, tell the stories you want to tell. Let's go to a conversation. Um, these colleagues have been saying all kinds of cool stuff. So I'm sure some of you are thinking about your own assignments, your own work. Please, let's start it out. Hi, uh, my name is Adrian. Um, this question is for Ms. Alcindor. Uh, I was just um, noticing that in the videos uh, from the protest that um, some of the subjects in it, you couldn't make out their faces. I was wondering if that was a conscious choice on your part not to um, um, you know, have the subjects in the video be identifiable, and uh, if you could talk a little bit about that choice, if it was. Yeah, um, you can't see their faces, but that's because their faces were covered. They were hiding their faces. I wasn't hiding their faces. Um, and mainly, I think they were hiding their faces, obviously, because they were breaking the law. But one of the things I'll say about when I was when I was filming that, um, I won. I don't know if it's a smart decision now, but it, it was the decision that I made. Um, when the store got when the store was broken into, I decided to follow them into the store. And I, there was another journalist with me that was that was also following them into the store. Well, so I was a little happy because it was like a kind of buddy system. But he kind of walked up and walked straight up into like to them and was like trying to interview them as they were stealing. And he basically got like kind of not accosted, but like pushed back and told to get out of their faces. While I never did that, so I think in that instance, I probably could have like gone into their faces and I don't know like gone closer to their eyes and really try to make them out. But for me, the idea was the destruction. So I wanted you to see moving figures and to see that people were taking things. But I also wanted to take pictures of the floor and take pictures of the walls and just show the total destruction that was happening. 
Um, but that wasn't that, that to me was me being as smart as I could be in that moment, which was I really wanted to be in that store and I really wanted to show what was going on inside the stores. But I also knew better and was smart enough to know not to just go up to them and put a point a camera in their face and say, answer my questions right now. I, and I, I think there's something important that 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 you said and that you said, which is that none of these are black and white situations. We are dealing as journalists with conflict in ourselves all the time as we're covering difficult situations. I want to be there, but it's scary. I want to be there, but it's dangerous. My, my boss, my colleague is saying, are you crazy? Get out of there. And I think part of the purpose of tonight's conversation is to get you thinking in a strategic way about opening yourself up to those voices of caution questioning your own judgment, and just observing the conflict in yourself so that you are making judgments informed by others and informed by your own evolving sense of your craft and what you're doing. And I should quickly say that I didn't talk to my editors about how to cover looting, and we never really, unlike maybe the AP in some ways, we didn't really have very deep conversations about how I was going to cover it because it was my very first time covering anything like this. So I just kind of went with my gut and my editors had, I would say, had no idea where I was in that moment. And again, that was something else that I think double, if I had to do it over again, I would have at least text somebody and said, hey, going into the store, like text me back in 15 minutes if I'm not out. But at that moment, no one knew. So when I filed those videos, everyone was like, wait, where's Yamish? And what did she do last night? Um, and it was great. And it was all over our TV stations. But it was one of those things that was like, one of my editors were just kind of like, well, that's interesting that you went in there. But like, let's have a conversation about this. So yeah. Hi, my name is Sang. And I have a question to Danny. That um, I started my career in Japan as a Korean. and. Um, from what I observed from the journalists killed in Syria is that the, the journalists, most of them are freelancers because from, um, because the, for example, the, Japan, for the media company in Japan, they don't send their journalists to Syria or the other conflict zone because they are, don't want to weigh, have the legal uh, risk. So they send all the freelancers to all the conflict zones like uh, Palestine or um, Syria nowadays. And do you think this um, journalists killed in Syria or in the war zones were killed because they lacked in the pro um, practice or the proper planning? Uh, you know, it's hard to say, you know, and I never actually second guess anybody who's made the supreme sacrifice uh, in losing their life or being subject to a serious injury in, in, in carrying out their duties and jobs. But what I will say is this, is that yes, there is a, probably an element of, the, of that, uh, whether or not they were prepared or not. One of the challenges that we have in the AP is how do we deal with journal, freelancers particularly when it comes to you know, providing them with the necessary training and equipment and whatnot. When they're under our umbrella, we do everything that we possibly can to provide either training, maybe not the formal training, but some type of first aid and hospital environment situational awareness training and then the equipment that we can provide them, we, we try to do that. But there's always an element of that, and without getting into the specifics of you know, those journalists that lost their lives, particularly those freelancers, my guess is, my educated guess is, that there probably was some element of that that, that came into play. Um, and I should say there's a lot of information about freelance safety that's on the Dart Center website, including uh, this pioneering um, statement by the AP Reuters and about 30 other news organizations and freelancer organizations about baseline standards for the industry, which John here was, um, played a heavy hand in drafting. And if, you know, but I would encourage you to talk to John afterwards. I just want to say also, we've mentioned a couple of times first aid and hostile environment training. I. I would encourage any of you who have the opportunity, regardless of what you're going to cover, to take one of these short courses or workshops. Not only do you learn some useful skills that may enable you to save your own or a colleague's life, but it increases your sense of control. And one thing we know from all the studies that have been done, both of sort of news judgment and judgment of first responders and of the psychological well-being of professionals covering traumatic events, is that resilience depends a lot on how much control you feel you have. You're much more likely to come away from terrible events with 
PTSD or some other kind of psychological injury if you've lost a sense of control. So anything that builds a sense of competence and control narrows the zone of the uncontrollable and allows you to exercise your news judgment better. And, and let me add to that, because I think that's an excellent point. I'm always asked, how, what were you thinking when John Hinckley fired six shots in 3.2 seconds? I noticed the reaction of the agents was extremely quick and fast, and everybody knew where they were going. Well, the reason for that was because we had seen that before. Because of our training, and of course up to that point throughout our history, the Secret Service history, there had always been a lone gunman. So the training, the, the continuous training that, that the agency gives its agents made it secondhand. The reactions that you saw, those were instinctive reactions because we had seen it before, time and time again. So it wasn't a situation where, you know, as a young agent, you go through training, you don't see it again. The repetitive training, okay, is what caused the reactions that you saw each one of those agents, to include Tim McCarthy, who basically spread ankles in front of the car because he was trained to do that. If you ever look at the video, you notice that, uh, you'll notice that the military aide, the guy who carries the secret codes and whatnot, now he's a military guy, so he's always trained when he hears, hears gunfire to hit the ground. He's the first guy on the ground. If the agents had fallen on the ground, believe me, we would have had a president and many more injuries there. The agents are trained to stand tall because they need to put themselves between the threat and the protectee in this particular case. So the training is essential. It makes you more comfortable. It gives you the, abil the, the, the sense that if you do run into something that turns very badly very quickly, you have the ability to act and act appropriately. Thanks. I okay. just want to add one thing to that, which is that when you are self-confident and you feel that you have um, the training, you also are cal a calming influence on the other people around you, including the people who you're doing reporting on. And so it helps your journalism. Yeah. Too. And actually, I, so I would add to that that uh, I generally find that on, in crazy places and on crazy assignments, photographers often are the calming presence. And I think it's in part because you, are, you have a mechanical job that you're doing. You're doing, the mu there's the muscle memory that kicks in about photography and so on. And those of us who do other kinds of reporting can learn from that, I think. So. Hi, so Yamish, you talked a little bit early on about having like the bag, you know, having this, you know, template of things that you bring with you or that you wish that you brought with you. Could you elaborate a little more on that? And Donna, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind actually doing the same and talking yes. about how it might be. Go for kits. Video. Let's talk yeah. go kits, ladies. I have a list, hold on. <laughs> um, so some of the things, okay, so first of all, I will even talk about the actual backpack. My colleague has a solar powered backpack that I'm really thinking about getting because sometimes even when I have like four chargers, somehow you're, you're reporting for 48 hours, you end up sleeping in a hotel that is not the hotel because that you were originally supposed to sleep at because the road's blocked, so now you're in a completely different place. Um, so he's a solar powered backpack that I think everyone should look into that has, especially because we have so many gadgets with us. Um, the other thing that I get, that I have is um, sneakers and I have rain, and I have raincoat all the time. So we were in Ferguson, quick funny story, I was in Ferguson wearing this raincoat because it just, I had, had on a dress again that was not very appropriate. So I had this raincoat on and my friend was laughing at me like, it's not gonna rain, like why do you have this raincoat on? Like I tell, I. Like he was, and he's a veteran reporter. Two hours later, it was like the hardest rain in the middle of the night we had ever seen. His beautiful three-piece suit for TV ruined. And I remember thinking, you know what? I really like my raincoat right now. So I think a raincoat is essential. And I was packed for, for because now I do TV a lot, which you might have broadcast reporters here. I always pack an extra shirt because if I'm gonna be on camera for MSNBC or something, I wanna try to look decent. Um, the other thing that I pack is mobile chargers. So I have I have, I have Mophie cases. So this right here is a waterproof um, charger for my phone. So my phone can be in up in water up to 30 minutes, and my phone will not be get water damage. So I invest in things like this, and I invest in also mobile chargers where you where your car charger becomes the three pronged um, thing. So you can actually plug your laptop into your car. It's essential because if you're writing a story or doing or editing a video on your laptop. Um, that's really important. 
And then the other thing, I always pack snacks. My favorite snacks are goldfish and granola bars um, <laughs> because they don't go bad and you can be in there for several months. Um, <laughs> And then the other thing, I also try to pack really light, like you said. Even though it's a lot of stuff, I really try, even though like tonight my backpack is not really very light. But I try to make my backpack not so heavy because if you're running and you're doing all this stuff or, or you just are carrying your bag for three or four weeks in a, in a rough situation, you don't want to have a backpack that's breaking your back. Um, I think. And the, and the last thing is, I the last thing I'll say is extra notebooks. I cannot stress that enough. Um, I still laugh because, like I said, I had that five-star notebook with, like, Hello Kitty on it. And it just, to me, it was, just, like, the most embarrassing thing to try to interview people. And they're looking at your notebook like, and, I, and I've already had um, police officers think I was writing for a high school newspaper, like, in my age right now. So I think that it does not help for me to show up with a Hello Kitty notebook to the NYPD and they're like, this kid is clearly like escaped from her high school and is on this front line and I'm trying to convince them a national reporter. So I think those are the things that I keep in my go bag. So really it's charging, it's food, it's clothes, and it's kind of just essential things that you need. So if it's, you know, if it's a camera or your extra batteries or a notebook um, or, you know, extra lenses and stuff like that. So that's what my go bag looks like. Donna? I'm pretty much the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, the only thing I would add, make sure you have some cash on you. I always have a money belt in cash because even ATM machines don't always work as, you know, during Hurricane Sandy. <laughs> I think there were places where people couldn't get money. So, you know, money, um, maybe a Swiss Army knife, you know, that's things that you would pack on a hiking trip. I always bring water, plenty of, you know, bars, and I also um, print maps, paper maps, because I just love maps and I just feel more secure when I can pull out my paper map, hardly weighs anything. I also make photocopies of my ID um, information, right? If I'm in a foreign country, I don't carry my passport with me in the street, I carry a photocopy, um, but I do that with my press IDs and um, other things as well. I always have, because sometimes you have to give them to people and you leave them behind, so I always have extra copies of that stuff. Sam? Water, and plenty of it, and not drinking water. If you're covering a protest or demonstration and gas is dispersed, you might want to make sure that you have water, enough water to flush. That's the response to any kind of tear gas, whether it be CS or CN gas, is to flush as soon as you can. So you want to have some water that you're not, use, that you're not using for drinking, but for flushing. And I would just add to that, if you're going to be on any assignment in the U.S. or anywhere that you're away from home for a couple of days, if there are medications that you need, and even if you only occasionally need them, pack them. If you have an asthma attack twice a year, pack your inhaler. If you have allergies, I guarantee you, you will have the worst allergy attack of the year while you're on deadline, right? Something to think about. Oh, yeah, because I, I always carry ibuprofen with me because if I get a headache or something happens, mainly if I'm hungry, I'm like, I'm like my head's hurting, and I'm like, okay, I need a ibuprofen to get me through this. So that's something that I also carry with me is, is like something, some kind of pain reliever. And I also, now I'm thinking about it, my go bag also has cold medication in it because it's literally every single time I get it, doesn't matter what time of the year, it has to be like my best assignment of the year, and I end up with a cold. So I always carry cold medication with me. Okay. Thanks. Right. Thank you all so much. She actually stole my um, initial question, but I have a second one that's ready. Um, in the introduction, you talked about what, what would we do if we were to go cover the Mets right now and there's a riot or something like that, protest. Um, do we go in the middle of the crowd or on the edges? If we see someone with a gun, what should we do? And I would really like to know what you guys would actually answer to those questions. So yeah, okay, any of you. Danny, I'll start with you. I'm most yeah. interested in his answer. <laughs> you know, we always talk about, uh, whenever I talk to our, our news group, in particular our photo groups, is that can you get that shot, in, the same shot, that Pulitzer Prize winning shot, at an angle? Uh, you never want to be right in the middle of the kill zone. I mean, that's what we profess. Uh, and when I say kill zone, I'm probably being a little bit harsh in that, but in the line of fire, in direct contact where the action is going on. So we're, are, we're Wherever you are, you want to make sure that you have an escape route. That is essential. I mean, I don't know how many of you know the Laura Logan story. She was, you know, accosted and, and, and fondled uh, during the riots in, in Cairo, okay, during the Arab Spring. They never had, when the crowd turned on them, they never had an escape route. And she actually had a couple of security guys with her as well as some other colleagues. And then when she got separated from them, then there was then it was too late. 
okay, as far as any response. So if you can get that shot, and, and I'm not a photographer by any means, okay, but I, mean, I talk to them all the time, you need to be where you can get, have an escape route, and that would be my basic fundamental comment on that. Donna, let me ask you something, or any of you, but I'm gonna start with you. What about if you're working on a story, you're doing an interview, and you, d you decide that your interviewee is a little more dangerous than you're comfortable with? Has that happened, and how have you handled it? Right. Um, it has. I try not to let my fear become visible. <laughs> because when people sense that you're afraid, um, that, that puts you in more danger, I think, sometimes. Not that I'm not going to be at the same time thinking, how can I get, get out of this situation as soon as possible? But I try not to do anything that's you know, extremely um, rapid. I, I try to maintain calm, you know, breathe deeply, take a deep breath, and then think about escape routes. How can I, and how can I kind of say goodbye and, and leave? You know? um, that's basically what I would do. So I'll to answer your question and then I'll answer hit Bruce's question. Quickly, if I was covering that, I would be right in the middle. And I don't know if I would have an escape route because that's the first time I've heard to have an escape route because I've never thought about that. I've always thought, how close can I get? I need to be able to see what I'm seeing. So the whole time I was in Ferguson, I have to say, I never really had an escape route. There was a, when the officer, no, when there was a young man shot on the anniversary, I don't know if you guys remember this, it was the year anniversary of Michael Brown's death and another man was shot. I was standing like across the street and I should say there was another young man who was working for NBC who like ran up and, and got all these shots of, incredible shots of like the, the, the young man on the ground. And I didn't get those shots, so I didn't run toward it because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not instinctively like that, but I, I, so I hit the ground. But I have to say that like after I hit the ground and the shooting stopped, I started walking toward where I heard those shots. Because in my mind, I thought, I want to go tell that story. And there was people screaming at me, because a lot of the protesters knew me, you mean you should get down, get down. And I was like, no, like I'm going this way. So I think that that's, again, I don't know if that's a smart decision, but to me as a reporter, I just thought this is where I want to be. But I will say, um, one time I was interviewing a man. He was I was doing a story on, on registered sexual offenders and kind of the 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 plight of some of these men who are trying to turn their lives around and who then um, can't do this because of ob obviously they're on this list and they have this record. So I, in my smartness as a young budding <laughs> reporter, decided to go into a basement with a young with this man who I didn't know and conduct my interview in his basement apartment. And it started to get really weird. And I like crawled my way up the stairs because I was just like. Like, look, like, I can't be here anymore. But it was like a gut feeling of, like, you need to get out of this situation. So I don't know if I let my fear show, but I basically, like, demanded to be let out of his apartment. Um, and he then started kind of, so it, that situation didn't go bad. I know from then on, I started to my editors, they were like, first of all, who, like, told you you should do that? And second of all, like, next time you meet these people, you should meet them in public and meet them in Burger Kings or somewhere else, which is what I did with him. So I didn't stop writing about him because I understood that, like, Sometimes people have mental problems. Sometimes people have, you know, like the people are still working through their stuff. So I still wanted to interview him and talk to him, but I just knew I had to do it in a public space. Great. Yeah, and that, that's an important thing because that, when I was working on the gang work that I did, at least in the beginning, I would always meet people only in a public space. And then once I got to know their mothers, their sisters, their families, it was different. I could go to their home. But at first, it was very important that I never be alone with any one person because that also can start, it's not even that I would be afraid of that person, but a rumor could start that there was something between us and his girlfriend might get angry, right? <laughs> you know, you, you, have to, you have to think about the social relations in the community that you're working in and be very attentive to all of it. Thank that's, you. That's great, thanks. Hi, um, thank you guys for being here. Um, you guys have all talked about group settings, you know, and we've seen through the pictures also, you're, you're obviously not out there alone, but there is this sense of, you know, get, being the first to get the story, um, the competitiveness, but I was also wondering if you could kind of talk about if there are those moments of camaraderie, though, you know, you might be competing for that story, but at the same time, like, when things really get rough, do you, does everyone kind of take a step back and help each other out? 
Yeah, so I think um, for me, I've uh, one of the best advice I got from my mentors were be were be nice to other reporters, and it really served me because one, if you're just, just on a practical level, I've covered trials, I've covered other things where you fall asleep or you miss something or you're late from the bathroom, and the, the AP reporter, I love AP reporters, so the AP reporters usually they hear everything, just I don't know why they must have trained them that way. So like, <laughs> so like no one else can hear the, exactly what the what the juror asks the question, but the AP somehow knows. So. <laughs> I like always would ask people like, wait, did I just hear that number or what did I miss? And if you've kind of established yourself as a nice person, then they're going to want to help you out. Most things, it's very hard to break a story in a group setting. So if you're covering something, you can, I think that having that camaraderie and Ferguson, it was definitely in that case. I was not paired with a photographer or a videographer for most of my time in Ferguson. So for most of the time, I was walking around as a reporter by myself. But I got really close with people from MSNBC and from the LA Times and from the Washington Post. And we would be able to really kind of check in on one, one another and ask questions. One of my friends, um, Gene Demby for, at NPR, he ended up writing a story about black journalists and kind of our camaraderie there too. And the fact that a lot of these, you would just go by and someone would just ask you, are you doing, are you okay? And it's kind of what you needed at that moment. And I, I constantly had people, I was lucky that a lot of my mentors were in Ferguson with me. So a lot of the people that were only 10, 15 years older than me, we were now all in the same story. So while obviously I was trying to break stuff that they didn't get because I wanted to be like, the, the student is better than the master in this one story, <laughs> I always thought to myself, like I'm like, these are kind of the masters. So I want to make sure that I also check in with them. So I think that that was helpful for me. No, I, and I would say that, um, you know, I'm a more experienced reporter. I like to mentor younger journalists. And so, you know, in the situation, even if it's competitive, everybody has a different viewpoint. Everybody brings something different to the story and to the reporting. You're not all going to get the same exact photograph or, um, and so there's no reason to, to have a kind of antagonistic relationship. I think it's, we're yeah. all stronger when we help each other. And I, I would say in, in my experience, both as a journalist and, and with the Dart Center, in general, our tribe is more uh, supportive of one another than the popular imagination would have you believe. Whether it's in local reporting in the US and you're all covering some ugly trial together, or in very, very dicey situations around the world. Most journalists know the difference between competition for story and image and our common shared experience as colleagues. And what's more, all of the studies that have been done of journalists and psychological resilience, just like all the studies that have been done of firefighters and cops and soldiers, show that strong peer support is the best predictor of handling difficult situations and difficult experiences well. And social isolation is the best predictor of problems. So I would actually turn it around and say it's not just a matter of our journalists supportive of one another, yes, we often are, but we should aggressively seek out collegiality and peer support, because it's good for us. We have 10 minutes, so I'd like to run through, everyone who has questions now, ask quickly, answer quickly. We're pledged to end in time for the math, so you know, gotta do it. Okay, quick question is, um, do you guys prepare yourselves with any sort of international emergency uh, med medical uh, insurance? Well, I, <clears throat> I now do have international medical insurance um, because I work at the University of Texas and as a faculty member I have it, but I didn't when I was in El Salvador. I had nothing and that was really not too smart. Yeah. I was lucky. Me so I mean, and all of you as Columbia students actually have international um, medical evac insurance as part of the basic package. When you're out, out there in the world, it's not very expensive. Just get it. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Just it, get it. Sorry, is that like med, uh, yeah, med, med assist, med medics or something med like that? Medics or ISO, there's a bunch of okay. them. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and, those, and many of those policies also will not only do medical evacuation, but other kinds of security stuff. So it's really worth looking at. Well, hi, Lucia Hoffman. I am a MS part-time student here. Thanks for being here. And uh, an ethical question, like, you know, journalists supposed to be impartial when we are covering you know, an event, but how hard it is for you and uh, 
you know, those people, they're going through a traumatic event, so is it hard for you not to get involved or offer some type of emotional support? I think, at least in my experience, there's objectivity really means striving for objectivity, and it also means knowing your bias. So I think that if you're if you're real with yourself, you know what you think about certain things. We're all human beings. So I think deciding what you know about things and then actively working against that. So I'm from inner city Miami. So when I look at 17 year old throwing rocks to the police, I can understand their anger. But I'm also like, I also have a brother who's a police officer. So I also think I need to also make sure I'm, I'm doing right alongs with the police and really humanizing those people. But I think in some ways you have to know, like I'm also a woman. So I think that if, we're, if I'm covering a story about abortion or something like that, I have to think, what's my body? Bias and how am I like actively counteracting that? Because I know what I think on certain things. And to me, at least in my experience, I, there are very few stories where I don't think, I don't have at least some sense of what I think is, is right and what I think is wrong. Even though in some cases, if, if you report, at least for me, if you report on some stuff, you really kind of tend to be skeptical from both sides. And for me, that's politics. I'm in some ways skeptical of everything that people say. So I think that there's that too. Yeah, I think the, the key is to know, you know, we have informed opinions because we learn a lot about stuff, and, and that's part of our job, right? I, I don't think that there is such a thing as, quote, objectivity, neutrality, or like that you don't have an opinion. You're not a stenographer. You, you know, climate change is real, right? I think most people in this room would agree with that, right? The science shows it. So there's no need to kind of balance a story by doing this kind of one, you know, one side, the other side, and giving them equal time. But at the same time, exactly what um, Yamish was saying, when I have a strong opinion, I want to go out of my way to be fair to the side that isn't the side that I naturally agree with. Um, I try to make sure that I, I don't caricature people or stereotype them, that I give them the same respect and dignity that I would give to anyone, you know, my family, or that I would want um, myself. And so yeah. that's really, I think, you know, um, what we need to do. And, and where this fits in with safety, to roll back to something that both Yamish and Donna said, you. is that you are if you are pressing back on yourself about your own biases, you're also going to make others who are around you, the subjects of your reporting, feel safer and more considered by you. So it's going to reduce the level of threat. If you're around police officers, if you're open to them, they're going to know that you respect them, right, et cetera. Hi. I'll keep this short. Um, as a photographer, your vision is sort of channeled in a really sort of intense way when you're out shooting, especially in a conflict situation. Yeah. How do you, and, and, and you tend to also be a bit of a lone wolf, unlike the Greek sort of situations that we've talked about earlier. What sort of checks and balances do you put in place to pull yourself out of that situation? And have there ever been any situations where you've left too early and you've regretted it, or you've stayed too long and regretted it? And how, with your experience, you start to balance those decisions? Okay. so. The first part, um, it, you know, sort of, I'm never, I never feel alone like a lone wolf because I develop relationships with the people that I cover. You know, I don't think that being objective or being fair minded means that I can't be friendly to people, right? And so I stay in places that, you know, um, one time I stayed in a community in Colombia when there was extreme violence going on, and because I stayed overnight, it was risky, but I knew it wasn't that risky. You know, I stayed with a family that I felt like it was a pretty secure location. I didn't just, you know, and I knew them. Um, but the fact that I was willing to stay there made people respect me so much more and really trust me because I was willing to be with them in, their situation. And for me, that form of connection, I never feel alone. I feel like I, you know, I'm, I'm connected to the people that I'm covering in a deep way. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I'm like not remembering the rest. You were asking about, oh, did I ever leave too early or too, too late? Yeah. I, you know, I tend to stay longer because I think that, <laughs> I think that unless it's dangerous and I have my escape route, but you know, often photographers think I got the picture, right? And they leave and then right after they leave, something else happens that's magical or that's more meaningful. It's not the kind of expected image, but it's something that shows, you know, sort of what's happening um, 
you know, say you're at an event and it's like the cleaning up of the event after it's all over sometimes can tell us more about that than the actual event itself. So, you know, that's not the greatest example, but at least it gives you an idea that the best pictures are often made when you stay later, when you stay longer, you know, and when you, you have the full, I feel I need the full experience in order to fully digest and understand what it is that I've been witnessing. Thank you. One of the greatest pieces of print journalism ever written by a man named Gary Wills, who's now a historian. As a young reporter covering uh, Martin Luther King's assassination and funeral, he was the only reporter to stay behind in the funeral home after everybody left and embed himself in that funeral parlor. He had trained as a priest. He knew how to talk to a funeral, funeral director. He talked his way into the funeral parlor and did a beautiful, beautiful piece of reporting about the relationship of these funeral workers, these mortuary workers, to the slain civil rights leader. So staying around when it's safe yeah. is, is a great idea. Um, I'm going to end it there. Yamish has a tip sheet, which we will make available through the DART Center website, and I'll post on the class Facebook page. This is the beginning of a conversation that I hope will go on through the year. We'll be doing some other events, and we'll welcome ideas from all of you about things that you want to hear about. But I would like us to thank three people who, who came out on a night when they could have stayed home getting ready for the Mets game. Uh, Danny Spriggs, Yami Shalcinder, and Donna DeCesare. <laughs>